Shalom and welcome to all the colors of the rainbow. Today we're going to line up the colors with the different covenants that appear in the Bible. Although some people talk about uh, seven covenants, they include a maybe an Edenic covenant or a an Adamic covenant. The word covenant breit does not actually appear except for these uh, six covenants, these six promises that God made with these people. The first covenant that God did make was with Noah um, as a result of having destroyed the world. Uh, he did save these eight people, God did, on the boat. And we're going to associate this covenant with the first color, with the red. For this reason, Genesis 9, 4, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of, of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So this is the, the first covenant, and it's also uh, one of the first uh, laws, one of the first Torot that mankind received after having been expelled from the garden. Uh, rabbis like to talk about seven Noahide laws. Really, only four laws were given to Noah when he got off the boat. And one of these is concerning the blood and the life that is in the blood. And in Genesis 9:11, God said, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more a flood to destroy the earth. So this is a initial covenant. We know that blood frequently figures in many of the covenants and in the covenant procedures, the ceremonies. So this is the first law concerning Blood. Yes, there was blood. Cain slew Abel. There was probably blood um, when God slew the animal so that Adam and Eve could have the skins. And undoubtedly, it's not that God did not walk in covenant with those people. In fact, they were in covenant, the people. Adam and Eve broke the covenant. However, the word covenant is not used there. So we're going to take this blood covenant idea. It's established with Noah. The second covenant was established with Abraham, and so we're going to line this up with the gold. And we see in Genesis 13, 2, and Abram was very rich in cattle in silver and in gold. Also, uh, in Genesis 15, 14, Abraham received the prophecy, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards they will come out with great substance. We know that all the gold that the Hebrew people had came out with them from Egypt. So Abraham received that prophecy of the wealth that the people would inherit. When we talked about one of the words for gold, uh, ketem, we talked about the fact that it meant a, a marking or a staining, possibly the color of blood. And we see that Abraham receives the first mark. Genesis 17:10. This is my covenant which he shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between betwixt me and you. So this is the first actual marking that takes place. The idea of ketem comes with the idea of being marked or stained in the color of blood. Also, when we talked about gold, we said that gold uh, is something that is purified, is refined in the fire. And we see Abraham going through a very severe test to uh, prove him, to prove to himself who he was in the face of God. Genesis 22.1, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. 
And the story of the binding of Isaac, of course, follows. The word there that is translated tempt is not a great translation. We know that God uh, does not tempt the man, but the better word would be to prove or to test Abraham so that that the, the God is not surprised at the outcome. God knows what's going to happen beforehand, but it proves something in Abraham that he is refined and tested as gold, and he comes out pure. Again, as we saw before, the color green is associated with the Torah, uh, with the flourishing, how we can flourish in life. And this is the covenant, of course, of Moses. Psalm 1, verses 2 and 3. But his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh, and in his Torah doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. In Proverbs 3.18, we know that the Torah is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. And uh, Paul cites in Romans 10.5, For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. If you practice Torah, you will have life. There's a flourishing. It's not the spiritual life of being born again, but in your natural life, there are laws that will uh, find their fulfillment as you live that out, and you will flourish like a green tree. The next covenant that is promised is the one that is given to Pinchas. And you remember the story that Balak hired Balaam to come curse the children of Israel. And he went around and around, and he only ever blessed them. So finally, he gave the king an idea. Well, you just need to let your women into the camp, and they'll distract the men. And uh, that's how they will wind up being cursed. And so there was a lot of hanky-panky going on. And Phineas, in his zeal, took a spear and speared through a man and a woman who were having relations in front of the tabernacle. And as a result of his zeal, God gives him a special promise. Numbers 25.11 Pinchas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy, Wherefore, say, Behold, I gave unto him my covenant of peace, and he shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. So this is a covenant of peace, and it's a covenant for an eternal priesthood. We see later in uh, Ezekiel that the line of Tzadok, Zadok will inherit this uh, priesthood. Ezekiel 44, 15. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord Yahweh. Ezekiel forty eight eleven. It shall be for the priests that are sanctified of the sons of Zadok, which have kept my charge, which went not astray, when the children of Israel went astray, as the Levites went astray. And later we see in Chronicles that this line of Zadok is directly descended from the line of Pinchas. The covenant of peace is mentioned in a few other places. Isaiah 54.10 for the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith Yahweh that hath mercy on thee. In Ezekiel 34:25, And I will make with them a covenant of peace, and will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell, dwell safely in the wilderness, and sleep in the woods. Again in Ezekiel thirty seven twenty six, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them, 
and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. So this covenant of peace is uh, eternal, it's everlasting, it clearly has a reference to uh, the millennial kingdom. In Malachi 2.5, my covenant was with him, uh, that is Levi, of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. Now, there is an ascribal anomaly uh, in Numbers 25-12 where it talks about the covenant of peace. And so you're looking at here one of the texts that indicates all the various um, differences in the way the texts are written. And you see that uh, in the last word there where it says shalom, the vav is quite small. And there's a little circle over it indicating a footnote. And I have cut and pasted that footnote below there. And so it says verse 12, and then it talks about the Vav, and it says Kitua. And Kitua means uh, like cut off or kind of lopped off. So it's telling you that this is how you will see the Vav in the Shalom, in the covenant of peace for fin Phineas, uh, in a Torah scroll. And here is actually a picture of how it's written in a Torah scroll. You can see that that vav is cut in half. What the rabbis say about that is that uh, what Phineas did was actually shocking. Even though it brought peace, it was extremely violent. And so not, this is not the ideal kind of peace where you have to wreak violence in order to have peace. There is a more complete and different piece. And so that is why there is this uh, broken vav in the word shalom as part of that covenant of peace. We know, in fact, that the real covenant of peace comes with Yeshua and that Yeshua, uh, in the end, will be our high priest. In Psalm 110.4, speaking of Messiah, it says, Yahweh hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So the earthly line of Tzadok, which means a righteous man, will pass to the order of Melchizedek, that is the king of righteousness, who is Yeshua. In Hebrews 7.15, and it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. The question is, why are we associating blue with this particular covenant? It's a covenant of the priesthood. If you remember before when we talked about uh, in Numbers how all the articles from the tabernacle, when the tabernacle is being moved, all those things are covered with that techelet uh, dyed cloth. It is blue. And it's also the color of the string on the tzitzit. And the connection is between the spiritual world and the physical world, which is held uh, in our physical and earthly life by the priesthood. The priest is the one who in times past, has provided us with that connection. In other words, if we had to go to the, to the tabernacle, the temple, and make a sacrifice, we go in a physical manner, we bring a physical animal, but the priest takes care of it, and somehow that becomes a spiritual act through the mediation of the priesthood. Yeshua serves the same function for us. Though he lives in us, he is still our entity intercessor forever. And so the connection between our physical life and our spiritual life remains that eternal priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, through Yeshua. So this is the picture of the blue. The next covenant was given to David, 1 Kings 2.45, and King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before Yahweh forever. In 1 Kings 9, 5, the Father says, And I will establish my throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David, thy father, saying, 
there shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. This is a promise that God made to David, that someone from his line would always be sitting on the throne. Of course, we talked before, purple is the royal color. Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment, judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will perform this. Jeremiah thirty three seventeen, For thus saith Yahweh, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel, neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offerings, and to kindle meat offerings, and to do sacrifice continually. So this is a royal, the royal promise. And in Luke 1, 32, uh, we see the prophecy about Yeshua being born. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. So these are the royal purple promises of that covenant to David. Now we are going to go into the violet uh, as we touch on the New Covenant. There's a lot of talk about the New Covenant. There are people that call themselves New Covenant believers, um, and they very much focus on the last third of the Bible, perhaps. But the New Covenant is never talked about in that part of the Bible. The New Covenant is defined in Jeremiah, beginning in verse 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith Yahweh, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it on their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No Yahweh, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith Yahweh. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. If you remember when we talked about the violet color, the segol, which is related to the segula, the am segula, the peculiar treasure of a people. All the beauty and the color is inside the closed up rock. It's a picture of the geode. It looks like a plain rock on the outside. When you break it open, all the beauty is on the inside. And so this is the picture of the new covenant that the word of Yahweh, God, is written upon our hearts and it's something on the inside. It's not something that we can automatically identify. It's not something that we can put on a robe and look a certain way. Of course, if we have it on the inside, we will have fruit coming to the outside. But this is something that comes from the inside. And this is what the new covenant is. This is the new covenant that Yeshua talked about in the Passover supper. Matthew 26, 27. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The word there as translated testament is more often translated as covenant in other parts of the um, translation. So when he is talking about the new covenant, he's not talking about something new that that just sprang into his mind or something that he was working on during his lifetime. He's talking about that covenant, which goes back to Jeremiah that God promised back in Jeremiah's day. And Yeshua brings it to fruition, to fulfillment in his day. The only way we can partake in that covenant is by understanding the purpose of his shed blood for our atonement for sins. The only way that we can participate is to be what is called born again or born from above, to receive that spirit, the spirit of the living God, through Yeshua, the Messiah for the whole world.
In Hebrews 8.10, it is written, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, uh, as quoted from Jeremiah. So this is the hidden covenant that was uh, only revealed with the coming of Messiah, with uh, his uh, birth, death, and resurrection, and his offering to us that part in uh, his life that we can uh, live in him and he can live in us. It's all hidden on the inside like the geode. Next time we'll do, I think, a little more physics of the rainbow and kind of maybe finish us up. In the meantime, Tasimata Inayam Keep your eyes on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.